Thank you for joining 50 Years of Consumer Action. We are pleased to have with us as a moderator, Susan Grant. Susan is the CFA Director of Consumer Protection and Privacy for the Consumer Federation of America. She's a recognized authority on consumer fraud, data protection, and privacy. She focuses on identity theft, online safety, security and privacy issues, and telemarketing, electronic and mobile commerce, deceptive marketing, fraud, airline passenger rights, and general consumer protection issues. She also serves on the steering committee of the Transatlantic Consumer Dialogue, a policy forum for US and European consumer organizations. Please welcome Susan Grant. I'd like to welcome everybody to Consumer Action's Change Makers Convening. I'm Susan Grant, Director of Consumer Protection and Privacy at the Consumer Federation of America, and I will moderate today's 90-minute convening. In honor of Consumer Action's 50th anniversary, we will examine some of the key consumer protection gains in the last 50 years. Then we'll discuss with our change maker panelists their past challenges and achievements. I'm sorry, I am having technical difficulty as well uh, in the areas of housing, credit, healthcare, and privacy protection, and their biggest priorities for the future. We will also hear briefly from some of today's preeminent consumer champions, Senator Elizabeth Warren, Consumer Financial Protection Bureau Director Rohit Chopra, and Congresswoman Maxine Waters. But first, Michelle Singletary, the award-winning personal finance columnist from the Washington Post, will kick off the convening with a look at some of the most influential changes in consumer financial protection over the last 50 years. Hi, thank you so much. I'm so honored to be able to talk to you about such a wonderful organization. You know, I'd like to start with a story about the power of being informed. In 2003, the Fair and Accurate Credit Transaction Act Transaction Act gave all consumers the right to an annual credit report from each company who maintains your credit records. Armed with information about our stellar credit history, my husband and I went into a car dealership to purchase a car. When we got to the part of the negotiations about paying for the vehicle, the salesman asked us if we wanted to use deal or financing. The salesman didn't know, however, that we had already lined up our financing with our credit union for a great low rate. But given what I do for a living, writing about personal finance, I humored him. Sure, I said, we would love to see what you would offer in the way of financing. He went back into some room, as they always do. When he returned, he offered us an interest rate that was twice the interest rate that was approved by our credit union. So, you know, I'm getting a little salty now. And I said, well, that rate seems awfully high. Uh, trying to control my anger. And then he says to me, well, it could be that you have some issues in your credit report. Now, those are fighting words for me right there. All my bills paid on time, all the time. Uh, so my husband watching this scene, because he usually lets me do the negotiations, um, he, he could see that I was getting salty. And he put his arm around my chest just to sort of hold me back, because he knew I was about to lunge across that desk and smack that man. <laughs> We have credit scores in the 800s and no other debt other than our mortgage. We knew we qualified for the best rates based on our credit history. Had we not known, however, how great our credit history was and how high our credit scores were, we might have taken that man at his word. We would have paid too much for the financing. Now, this was a time where you didn't have access to credit scores. And so when we applied for a credit score at the credit union, we asked them to give us our credit score so we would have that information. It's not something that they gave to us. We had to ask for it. But nonetheless, we know from class action lawsuits over the years that there is a two-tier pricing system for auto loans um, that, it, that penalizes Blacks and Hispanics. It is a common practice for dealerships to mark up interest rates on car loans whenever possible, no matter the prospective buyer's race or for that matter, their credit history. 
But expert research has found that white buyers aren't targeted as often. And when they are, the markups are not as high as the markups for minorities. In 2015, the credit, uh, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau reported that more than 50 million consumers now have free and regular access to their credit uh, scores through their monthly uh, credit card statements online or online. This type of access would not have been made possible if not for organizations like Consumer Action. The moral of my story, consumer laws along with consumer action works. In 1962, President John F. Kennedy delivered a written message to Congress on protecting consumers. And Kennedy said, and this is me, I'm quoting him, consumers by definition include all of us. They are the largest economic group in the economy, affecting and affected by almost every public and private economic decision. Two thirds of all spending in the economy is by consumers, but they are the only important group in the economy who are not effectively organized, whose views are often not heard. The federal government by nature, the highest spokesman for all the people has a special obligation to be alert to the consumer's needs and to advance the consumer's interests. Even if ever since legislation has been enacted in 1872 to protect consumers from frauds involving the use of U.S. mail, the Congress and executive branch have increasingly been aware of their responsibility to make certain that, na that the nation's economy fairly and accurately serves consumers' interests. This is Kennedy talking. Kennedy went on to say, if consumers are offered inferior products, if practices, if prices are exorbitant, if drugs are unsafe or worthless, if the consumer is unable to choose on an informed basis, then his dollar is wasted, his health and safety may be threatened, and the national interest suffers. He, he, female or male consumers, that is, right? I'd like to briefly highlight 50 years, five decades of consumer protection. So in the 1960s, we had, of course, um, the Civil Rights Act of 1968, more commonly known as the Fair Housing Act, prohibits discrimination in the sale, rental, financing of housing based on race, color, national origin, religion, sex, familial status, and disability. Passed in 1968, the Truth and Lending Act protects you against inaccurate and unfair billing and credit practices. It requires lenders to provide you with loan cost information so that you can comparison shop for certain types of loans. In the 70s, we had the Fair Credit Reporting Act which holds credit reporting businesses such as credit bureaus responsible for the accuracy and security of our personal information. This law helps to ensure the privacy of the information and in consumer credit bureau files. The law regulates the way credit reporting agencies can collect, access, use, and share the data they collect in your credit reports. Passed in 1974 was the Equal Credit Opportunity Act, which prohibits discrimination on the basis of race, color, religion, national origin, sex, marital status, age, and receipt of public assistance. The purpose of this law was to give individuals an equal opportunity to obtain loans and other types of credit from financial institutions and other lenders. Effective in 1978 was the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act which was the designed to eliminate abusive, deceptive, and unfair debt collection practices. And this is such an important law because just because you're a debtor does not mean that you don't have rights. You don't have the right, or credit uh, collection agencies don't have the right to lie to you. In 1980s, there was the Financial Institutions Reform, Recovery, and Enforcement Act which was enacted in the wake of the savings and loan crisis of 1980s. And one major change brought about because of this legislation was regulations to assure that the real estate appraisals that we get are performed adequately. In the 1990s, we had the Financial Services Modernization Act. And as the Federal Trade Commission explains, this law requires financial institutions, companies that offer consumers financial products or services like loans, financial or investment advice or insurance to explain their information sharing practices to their consumers and to safeguard their sensitive data. 
And we know there's some issues in that still. And the 2000s past the 2010 was the most important Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform and Consumer Protection Act which was enacted in response to the devastating financial crisis of 2008. The law restricts the ways banks can invest and limited speculative trading. One of the most important things that came out of as a result of Dodd-Frank was the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, a much needed watchdog agency charged with preventing predatory mortgage lending. For 50 years, Consumer Action has been around as a watchdog for all of these protections. I'd like to circle back to what President Kennedy said about consumers. And again, this is him talking. Their voice is not always as loudly heard in Washington as the voices of smaller, better organized groups, nor is their point of view always defined and presented. But under our economic as well as political form of democracy, we share an obligation to protect the common interest in every decision we make. Consumer action is the voice for those who can't speak for themselves, whose voices might not otherwise be heard. Here's to many more decades to work to an organization whose mission it is to speak up and speak out for consumers. Thank you. Thank you for highlighting some of the gains that have been made for consumers in the last five decades, Michelle. Consumer Action has been actively involved in this work, and I know that it will continue to fight for fairness in the marketplace. But it's not a fight that Consumer Action or any one organization can wage alone. We're fortunate that there are so many great groups working to advance consumers' interests in housing, credit, healthcare, privacy, and other issues. Now I'd like to introduce our Changemakers panel of experts whose work in housing, credit, healthcare, and privacy make a difference in people's lives. I'm joined by Nikitra Bailey, Senior Vice President at the National Fair Housing Alliance, Graciela Aponte, oops, there I go again. Graciela Aponte Diaz, Director of Federal Campaigns for the Center for Responsible Lending. Frederick Isasi, Executive Director of the Healthcare Advocacy Organization Families USA. And Katrina Fitzgerald, Deputy Director of the Electronic Privacy Information Center. Welcome to you all. Their bios are in the program for this convening, which you'll find in the chat box. The Q&A box is where you'll post your questions for panelists, and we'll get to as many of them as possible toward the end of the convening. Since this is a celebration of consumer advocacy in the past, as well as in the future, I've asked each of these advocates to look at their past work and give us an example of a major issue they dealt with. Did they succeed in reaching their goals? And what were the main reasons for that success? Or if they encountered too many obstacles to achieve what they wanted, what were those obstacles and what lessons did they take away from that experience? So let's start with Nikitra in the area of housing. Nikitra, how would you answer that question? Congratulations, Consumer Action. Um, 50 years is remarkable, and we appreciate being your ally and your partner in this important work. So I will start with answering the question by focusing on um, a little bit about what Michelle talked about, and then I'll get to my answer. I just can't resist the fact that she mentioned our nation's fair lending laws. As you know, NAFA is a national civil rights organization with the 30 year track record of being at the forefront of working to eliminate all forms of housing discrimination and ensuring that every community is well resourced with opportunities and amenities for people to thrive. And our nation's fair lending laws have been a way that we've been able to do that. Um, when you think about the remarkable advancements of the Fair Housing Act of 1968 and the Equal Protection the Equal Credit Opportunity Act of 1974, we've seen significant advancements in housing as a result of these just historic civil rights legislations to really open up opportunity for more Americans. 
housing is so central to opportunity in our country. So the fact that our fair lending laws actually made housing more fair for more Americans is something that's incredible. And the Fair Housing Act's affirmatively further and fair housing mandate is something that's really remarkable because what it does is it allows for us to, with intentionality, create integrated communities. So to undo previous residential segregation and to create communities of opportunity for all Americans. So I couldn't resist the opportunity. And then my, my main point today is the Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform and Consumer Protection Act. Um, I had the good privilege of working on that in my former position. And what's remarkable about the Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform and Consumer Protection Act as it relates to housing, particularly is that it stopped a lot of the predatory mortgage lending that we saw targeted at families of color. We know that leading into the Great Recession, Families of color were disproportionately targeted with dangerous and risky mortgage products, even when they qualified for loans on safer and more affordable terms. And as a result, Black and Latino communities lost a trillion dollars of wealth from those dangerous and risky loans that led to disproportionate levels of foreclosure in our communities. So the Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform and Consumer Protection Act is something that is just remarkable in the sense that it really cleaned up the mortgage market and it made mortgage lending safer for consumers, but also for lenders themselves. And today we have have really a more safer uh, mortgage market, and we have an opportunity to do more to make sure we are ensuring credit access for all communities. So I'll wait for my next round of remarks to talk about those. Well, thank you very much, Nikitra. That certainly was landmark legislation, and congratulations to you and everybody else who, uh, who worked on that. Let's turn now to Graciela. What triumph or challenge in regard to credit would you like to highlight from the past? Oh, hi, thank you. Thank you for this invitation. Um, so what I wanted to talk about was access to credit. And there is a, a delicate balance between providing access to credit, making sure folks have uh, the money that they need uh, for purchasing, for building wealth, um, and also just the cost of credit. And so making sure that it's not extremely expensive in, and not predatory. Uh, so that, that is a, a delicate balance. Um, you know, throughout the states, we've historically had usury caps, strong usury caps. And uh, in, in the 80s, there was a, a huge effort to deregulate. And so what I will deregulate and, and you know, we're talking about your very small dollar, you know, payday car title loans and your higher dollar installment loans. So 2000, 5000, even up to $10,000 loans. So what I'd like to focus on is an effort in California um, that I worked on. So I'm actually, I'm from Maryland, DC. And, and so I was out in, in California in 2012 and, and now I'm back, but 2012, and I was out there for, uh, for seven, seven, almost eight years. And what I did not know was what a payday loan was <laughs> because we don't, we don't have these loans in Maryland, which has really strong consumer protection. And so working at the Center for Responsible Lending, um, you know, this was the big issue in, in California where there are payday loans, 300% APR loans, with a two week uh, payback. And then there were even really like $2,500 loans with 150% APR that would balloon into $10,000 uh, because the length of the loan. Uh, so over a three year campaign, a very painful campaign <laughs> because no one actually wanted to introduce the bill. Uh, so it was just the first year was just knocking on doors and saying, this is important. This is, this is devastating people's lives. Some of these loans are secured by your, the, their vehicle, like their car to get to work, to take their kids to school. Uh, so what we did is we just sort of focused on just your $2,500 to $10,000 loans. Um, so leaving the, the payday loan piece for another day. Um, that was where the surge was in California. That's where they had deregulated. The CFPB was created. 
and there was this huge shift in the market to these larger loans. So, um, so we built a coalition, got a lot of folks interested, faith leaders, uh, community leaders from the African American community, Latinx community, uh, veterans, and even lenders who were in support. And um, yeah, three years later, <laughs> the bill passed um, and there is an interest rate cap bill of 36% uh, for the loans of 2,500 to 10,000. So we, we're just now seeing the numbers come in um, for 2020, where it has reduced from like 300,000 predatory loans in that segment to 15. And so we're very happy about that. Thank you, Graciela. Thanks for your persistence. And I know that you're going to um, succeed in covering the rest of the, uh, the, the monetary amount in the future. Um, Frederick, uh, what about in the healthcare realm? What would you say was your uh, biggest triumph or challenge in the past years? Susan, thank you so much. It is such a joy to be here, to be part of this. Uh, thank you to Consumer Action, to you and to my terrific panelists. Um, I admire each and every one of you and the incredible work you're doing. Thank you for protecting me. I really appreciate it. Um, Families USA, for folks who may not be familiar with us, we're, we've run for over 40 years and we are the leading voice for healthcare consumers, both in Washington, DC and in a lot of state capitals around the country. We work to ensure the very best health and healthcare are equally accessible and affordable to every living soul in our nation, no conditions, no parentheses. Health should be a part of everyone's life in our country. Um, this is such a great question, Susan, and um, there's a lot to talk about. Of course, you know, there's huge victories like the creation of the Medicare Medicaid program or um, the CHIP, the Children's Health Insurance Program, or um, of course, the Affordable Care Act. I was very, very involved in, in the writing in the past of the Affordable Care Act, huge accomplishments. But right now, as everyone who is watching us um, may or may not know, an incredibly important piece of legislation is working its way through Congress. This is the so-called human infrastructure bill or build back better. There's some really important provisions in there. And on healthcare in particular, huge victories. Um, a lot around coverage, so finally filling in the coverage gap for folks who might live in states where their governors and state legislatures have not um, been willing to extend the Medicaid. Humongous, really important issue, making coverage in the health insurance marketplaces, people who are buying private coverage for themselves, less expensive, more protections for, their, uh, for the amount of money they have to spend to get good high quality healthcare. These are all really important. But the one I wanna highlight for sure is that we are finally making ground on taking, on taking on the terrible abuses of drug makers and drug companies against the American consumer. We are finally making some ground here. In this legislation, um, we actually have the ability for the government to finally get in there and negotiate fair drug prices on behalf of the American consumer. This was hard fought. Uh, folks may, may, uh, may or may not know this, but last week when the, when the uh, final deal was announced, this wasn't in the package, despite the fact that the chairman of the Committee of Jurisdiction in the Senate, the chairman of the Committee of Jurisdiction in the House, the president and the speaker of the House had all take leadership positions to champion this legislation. It wasn't in the deal. We raised our voices. We fought tooth and nail and it's in, and people should be so proud of that. So um, what I would say here is this, there's likely gonna be a vote on Friday on this legislation. So if you haven't gotten involved, please reach out to your member of Congress, let them know how important this bill is to you. Um, the second thing I would say is it's been such hard work and a lot of people, you know, this is often, I think the experience of success. People see this last step and they think, oh, wow, look at that, that's amazing. Well, we've had about 100 failures before we got to this point. Uh, 15 years ago, when I was working as a senior uh, legislative counsel in the Senate, we were taking on pharma left and right. We lost every single fight. So in this case, we won this far. We still haven't won the, you know, we, we've won each, at each step of the way here, but we aren't all the way across the finish line. We won because we did a lot of groundwork. We really did a ton of work and research to show how bad the problem was. This is an incredibly abusive industry, sometimes raising their prices, not just annually, but month to month. This is an industry that's worth over a trillion dollars a year in this uh, around the world. They make more than half their profits just in the United States and Canada. And we are spending three or four times more on a drug than anyone else in the world. 
And often the most important point really, I think is that what we've seen in the last five or six years is that the entire industry has reoriented itself to try to abuse their market distortions and peg drugs at uh, the catastrophic level in Medicare instead of finding those drugs that are gonna save our lives and make us healthy. So it's a really good example of an industry that is flush with money, is leveraging the distortions in law to make money, but aren't serving the interests of consumers. You know, we, and, and this is wildly popular, about 90% of Americans across the country agree with this. Democrats, Republicans, it doesn't matter what party you belong to. We are fed up with the prices we're paying for drugs. We know that we should be getting a better deal. And so this is happening right now as we speak. Uh, and I really hope everybody out there who's sharing my voice will get involved, call the member of Congress and say, you, uh, we need to pass, build back better immediately. We need to invest in our nation's families and uh, in fair drug prices. Thank you, Frederick. And uh, it's great that you brought up such a recent example, building on all the work that you've done before. And um, here's hoping that it actually goes through. Katrina, what stands out for you in the past in terms of uh, privacy? Yeah, thank you, Susan. Uh, you know, I'll just for, first note that I've learned so much from you as an advocate, as well as from Ruth and Linda, Consumer Action. So I feel so fortunate to work with you all. And I'm so grateful to Consumer Action for 50 years of protecting consumers. Um, so EPIC is focused on protecting privacy, freedom of expression, and democratic values in the information age. And we haven't quite been around 50 years, but we've been around for 27, which for an organization focused on internet privacy is basically like being around since the beginning of time. Uh, we've seen a lot since 1994 when it comes to consumer privacy online, but I'll focus on one uh, particular experience for this, for this exercise. Back in 2009, a couple of engineers launched WhatsApp. And within seven years, the app had 1 billion users worldwide. It was pretty popular. Uh, WhatsApp was committed to privacy. It, they completely rejected in-app advertising. They did not collect or store user data, period. Uh, you know, in 2012, one of the founders took to their blog and explained their anti-advertising stance. And they warned users that when advertising is involved, you, the user, are the product, uh, which we know all too well now. Um, so WhatsApp was a great privacy protective app, but then, oh, but then in 2014, Facebook announced that it was purchasing WhatsApp for $19 billion. Um, so Epic used the tools at our disposal, you know, ones we'd used in the past. We, along with the Center for Digital Democracy, sent a very detailed complaint to the Federal Trade Commission in an attempt to block Facebook's acquisition of WhatsApp. And we explained that WhatsApp had built its user base based on its commitment not to collect consumer data for advertising revenue. Uh, now those users are gonna be you know, automatically ported over to Facebook. Um, you know, unfortunately, ultimately the FTC approved the Facebook WhatsApp merger after the companies promised not to change WhatsApp's user privacy settings. And to the surprise of no one, except I guess the FTC, two years later, Facebook announced that it would acquire the personal information of WhatsApp users. So we filed another complaint with the FTC and the FTC did nothing. Now, six years later, the FTC does want to go back and unwind the merger. Uh, you know, it's filed a lawsuit to do so, but doesn't unfortunately seem like the courts are gonna let that move forward. So, you know, yes, unfortunately, in the case of WhatsApp and you know, similar problematic mergers so far, we've run into too many obstacles to achieve what we wanted. You know, namely, the US does not have a federal privacy law. So there's very few rules of the road that Facebook had to follow as it swallowed up privacy protective apps like WhatsApp, nor do we have a government agency focused on privacy and data protection that may have been better able to enforce the restrictions and promises that were made around the Facebook WhatsApp merger when it came to personal data. Uh, but on the bright side, you know, we've seen some great bills proposed in Congress in the last couple of years. Uh, you know, they would go a long way towards changing the harmful business practices in the technology sector. Uh, the Online Privacy Act from Reps Eshoo and Lofgren, the Data Act proposed by Senator Sherrod Brown, um, COPRA proposed by Senator Cantwell, Data Protection Act by Senator Gillibrand. These are all examples of really good privacy bills that include many of the provisions advocates like Epic and Consumer Action and CFA have been pushing for for a long time. And the Build Back Better Act that Frederick was discussing, it also it includes uh, 500 million to create a dedicated privacy bureau at the FTC, which is not quite the dedicated agency we want and think we need, but it's a big step in the right direction. It would go a long way. So 
um, you know, we're going to keep doing what we're doing and what consumer action has been doing for 50 years. We're going to keep pushing Congress to protect consumers. Thank you, Katrina. It certainly wasn't for lack of trying on your part and everybody else's. And uh, we will persist and I think we will ultimately prevail. So thanks for sharing that example. And now let's hear some inspiring remarks. Uh, we have uh, a uh, uh, two videos, one from Senator Elizabeth Warren and another from CFPB Director Rohit Chopra. Hello, Consumer Action, and happy 50th anniversary. Over the last 50 years, we have made a lot of progress in leveling the playing field for American consumers. And thanks to the advocacy of many of the people who are here today, along with consumers, civil rights, labor, senior, and community organizations all across the country, 10 years ago, something really amazing happened. The Consumer Financial Protection Bureau opened its doors. Now, very few people in Washington thought it was possible ever to have such an agency. Even after the worst financial crisis in generations, people were skeptical that we could overcome the full force of the banking lobby and their friends in Congress, and that we could actually create an agency that would work on behalf of working families. But we did it. And look at what that little agency has done in just 10 short years. It's forced the banks and financial institutions to return nearly $13 billion directly to people they cheated. It's fielded more than 2.3 million consumer complaints. It's put in place common sense protections for American service members and vets. And the part we can never quite measure is that over the past decade, millions of people have not been cheated, all because some financial outfit with a sleazy idea looked around and realized there's a watchdog ready to bite. The creation of the CFPB teaches us that we can make government work, not just for the wealthy and well-connected, but we can make it work for everyone. So from the bottom of my heart, Thank you for being a part of this. Keep up the great work and happy 50th birthday, Consumer Action. The law creating the CFPB's consumer complaint system was a critical reform. People all across the country used the system to get real help and an actual response from financial companies. In many cases, it's led to big refunds and real change since enforcers across the country can use it to spot trends and stop systemic abuses. I want to thank Consumer Action for all of its work to make it a success. Thank you, Director Chopra and Senator Warren. I'd like to note that Consumer Action has led the charge to ensure that the CFPB's complaint database a vital resource for consumers, advocates, researchers, and others provides full information about the financial service problems that consumers report. So the second question I pose to our changemaker panelists is forward-looking. What are the most important issues for you now and that you expect to deal with in the future? What do you hope will be achieved? And what must be done by consumer advocates government and the public to help get us there. Uh, let's start with housing, Nikitra. We have a once in a generation opportunity. I'm so grateful Frederick brought up the Build Back Better Act. I'm just gonna go straight to it. We have a once in a generation opportunity to really rectify our nation's history and legacy of housing discrimination. We know that for much of our country's history, home ownership has been the way that we've built and established a stable middle class. And we have to be honest about that. And the doing of those home ownership policies, we implemented them in a way that were not fair and equitable. So we implemented them in a manner where most of the benefits went to white families and most of the burdens went to Black, Latinos, Native Americans, Asian Pacific, Asian American and Pacific Islanders and others. So our communities were in many ways left behind by our nation's housing investments. So we used an intentionality to really create a sustainable white middle class 
And we now have this opportunity to use the same type of intentionality to really expand opportunity for more Americans through housing policy and to really strengthen and grow the economy for everyone. So some of the things that I wanna really lift up is this provision in the Build Back Better Act, which we are extremely excited about, which is the first generation down payment assistance in the bill. The bill currently has $10 billion for first generation down payment assistance. Now we all know about first you know, time home buyer programs. So what's different with first generation down payment? This funding is for families who have been burdened by previous federal housing policies because their families were not able to use home ownership to really build up the kind of wealth that white families have been able to build up. We know that because whites had access to home ownership earlier, they have today five times the wealth of Latinos and eight times the wealth of African Americans. And because of that, there's an ability to pass forward down payment assistance to the next generation of home buyers. Well, for Black and Latino families and other families of color, that's not possible. This first generation down payment assistance helps us to make sure that those communities that prior federal housing practices left behind actually have the resources that they need to be able to purchase a home. Because one of the biggest barriers today to purchasing a home is the inability to come up with a down payment. We've seen data from different organizations that show that saving for a down payment, especially in high cost markets, could take some people upwards of 30 years. So if you don't have that prior advantage of having access to that opportunity, you have a longer time and you are at a position where you're pushed outside of the market place as opposed to being an active participant in the marketplace. So we can use this targeted down payment assistance to really grow and expand opportunity for nearly 5 million new home buyers. We know that of the 5 million new home buyers, that 1.7 million of them are Black, 1.32 million are Latino, and that 1.4 million are white. So this is a program that allows for us to look at our country's history of exclusion and to create targeted solutions to bring in the very communities that we that we left behind. And you might ask me, you know, Nikita, why is it that this is so important? We have a persistent black white home ownership disparity in home ownership rates. Whites have consistently had a 30 point higher percentage gap of home ownership than Black Americans. So despite our nation's fair lending laws and despite all the progress that we made with Dodd-Frank, we still are in a situation where families of color are underserved by our nation's housing finance system. And we know that the credit restrictions that went into place after the enactment of Dodd-Frank really hurt and hampered access to mortgage credit for creditworthy families. According to data from the Urban Institute, we would actually see an additional 770,000 Black home buyers if these unnecessary restrictions were not in place. So we need programs like this targeted down payment assistance to really reach in and bring in the very buyers that we left behind. And another reason why it's really critically important is because we know that home ownership and the wealth that it creates are the foundation of the solidness of our, our nation's middle class. It would take Black Americans an additional 228 years to catch up to the wealth disparity with whites. And I just want us to just ponder what that means. Our nation's federal policies, policies that my grandparents paid for, that excluded them, have hurt them in a position that we're so far behind that it would take upwards of 228 years for us to catch up in wealth because of these unequal investments. So now we have a chance to really look at these millennials who are mortgage ready. Data from Freddie Mac and the Urban Institute shows us that there are millions of mortgage ready Black and Latino consumers who are prepared to jump into the homeownership market and to really um, benefit 
benefit from the, the, the healthy benefits of home ownership and to really have an opportunity to have the type of economic stability that we can remove the burdens of past discrimination. And we're extremely excited about the Build Back Better Act's provision because it adopts Chairwoman Maxine Waters' Down Payment to War Equity Act, which is this grand investment, you know, to take this initial first step to really try to address these historic and ongoing home ownership disparities that not only hurt Black and Latino communities, but that actually hold back the whole economy. We know from data that over the last 16 years that our economy has suffered immensely because of discrimination. And if we actually just look at discrimination targeted at Black Americans alone, we can address that discrimination and we could see the entire economy grow by $5 trillion over the next five years. So we know that racism costs us, but here's an opportunity to really use a solution to really answer that harm and to really help benefit all of us. So we are extremely excited about what's in the Build Back provisions um, as it relates to first generation down payment assistance. This targeted assistance is something that could really help grow the economy and really will benefit all of us. And what's interesting is that these Build Back provisions are supported broadly, overwhelmingly by Americans. So when we look at polling data, recent polling data, from the Bipartisan Policy Center on housing issues, uh, look at what's going on on housing. Affordable housing is an issue that most Americans want to be addressed. And according to a poll by the Bipartisan Policy Center and the Morning Consult, the the, the poll shows that most Americans, including a majority of Republicans, independents, and Democrats, support significant funding for housing issues included in public housing repairs, tax credits to develop and renovate homes in distressed communities, down payment assistance for first generation home buyers, and voters want you know, action now because there's not a city or a town in our nation where, you know, a person that's making minimum wage can actually afford to have a two bedroom uh, rental apartment in an affordable way. So we're all experiencing this, this really um, challenging issue around housing affordability in our nation. So we have this opportunity where the Biden administration and the Congress can take really bold action. They could make history by investing um, just a minimum of $30 billion would close the, 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 the racial homeownership disparity rates between whites and Latinos and whites and blacks by one percentage point. This administration could have a major victory and, and really change the course of of home ownership policy in our nation. So that, that is a provision that we are just really excited about. We've worked really hard and we've continued to, to advocate for that. And we will ask everyone here today to really reach out to your member of Congress and let them know that this investment in targeted down payment assistance for first generation home buyers is an investment in all of us. There are other provisions in the Build Back Better Act that are really important to us as well. We see for the very first time significant historic funding for fair housing enforcement. Our nation's fair lending laws are, have been under enforced for, for such a, a historic period of time. And our local fair housing agencies are on the ground and they are really working with consumers who are facing discrimination in housing and helping them to file complaints and to seek legal redress. So what's in the Build Back Better Act is significant funding for local fair housing agencies. There is right now $700 million for fair housing initiatives program and then $100 million for the fair housing assistance program. These are critical dollars that will impact our neighborhoods and we need to make sure that that funding survives. We also have the Neighborhood Homes and Investment Act, which is a critical investment in revitalizing communities that have been hardest hit by the Great Recession and then COVID-19 um, in terms of home ownership. These funds would help us to revitalize and rehab homes, really making it more affordable for owner occupants to return to home ownership opportunities in our communities. So we have this great chance before us with the Build Back Better Act to really look at our nation's exclusionary housing policies and to make an intentional choice to rectify them. And I know for some people, 
that scary. But the reality is when we hold back one community, we actually hold back all communities. And I'll take us back to the Great Recession. You know, leading up to the foreclosure crisis, Black and Latino communities, people who um, qualified for mortgages on safer and more affordable terms were actually scared into dangerous and risky mortgages. We call for action. We work with Consumer Action and our other partners to really push for action. Congress waited. So what we saw was disproportionate levels of foreclosures in Black and Latino communities. Those foreclosures actually had a high in 2006. So the market actually did not crash until 2008. So what we know is when we do targeted efforts at communities that have a history of underservice, we have an ability to really make sure the entirety of the market is protected. Protected. So this investment in targeted first generation down payment assistance, this investment in fair housing enforcement is really an investment in a healthy economy overall. Seven out of 10 future home buyers are going to be people of color. If we're going to have a healthy housing market, we're going to need to make sure that the borrowers that are the future are able to access the mortgage credit that they deserve and that they can benefit from Dodd-Frank's, you know, safety um, that it is injected into the marketplace so that our communities have a chance to really build long-term sustainable wealth so that when the future health pandemic comes, right, because that's the lesson of this one, when the future health pandemic comes, our communities are on solid footing and we are able to sustain as well because there has been a targeted and uh, intentionality to making sure equity is possible for more Americans. Thank you, Nikitra. You know, we hear a lot about this legislation, but you've given us some real tangible examples of why the provisions of it are so important and I appreciate it. Graciela, what are you aiming for in the future in the area of credit and how are you going to get there? Awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so, you know, as I had mentioned before, there were various state efforts, one to deregulate and, and now uh, again to, to come back and have some strong interest rate caps through ballot initiatives and, and state bills. Uh, there are now 18 states plus the District of Columbia that have strong uh, caps that curb payday lending, and there are 45 states that have um, that have caps on your your higher dollar installment loans. And I know my my subject area is access to credit on this panel, right? And I think I had mentioned this this balance of you know making sure that you know we're working toward making credit available, but curbing your predatory lending. And so I, I, I use this example a lot of, you know, my, my mom is from Maryland, you know, single mom, low income, who living in another state would have likely been targeted with a predatory loan. However, she wasn't. And she knew about the nonprofits to go to and how to get assistance from churches and things like that. And she now, I'm going to take the credit, but has like an 800 or so credit score. <laughs> um, she's a homeowner. Um, and, you know, and it's so great. And, and just having the contrast of living in a state that did not have those protections. And when you have, you know, new immigrants, there's so many like waves of immigration in California. You've got like 10th generation Latinos and, and people who are, who are just coming into this country and seeing the number of storefronts in these communities, um, you know, makes you think, oh, is this, this is where I go to get credit here in the US. Um, and now, you know, there's maybe a reduction in storefronts, but those same people are now getting targeted online, right? Like if you gave your, your information at some point to a storefront, you're going to get these, these online um, ads, phone calls and things like that. So um, to answer your question, I think there are, there are three things that, that, I'm, that I'm thinking about that CRL is working on. One being uh, the, the CFPB's payday rule. Uh, so there was a very thought out five year process to figure out what can the CFPB do to address predatory lending. And, you know, there was a great payday rule uh, that really the, the heart of it said, you must assess someone's ability to repay prior to giving them this loan. 
which would have eliminated a lot of the predatory payday car title loans um, through the Trump administration that had been repealed. So I guess we're working on repealing the repeal <laughs> is, is how I'll talk about it. But that's, that's one major thing that we want to work on. Uh, we have something there that, like I said, it was well thought out. We worked on it for, uh, for five years. I mean, millions of comments from across the country to really get to this point. And, and I know a lot of folks are on this call now that are, you know, are part of that and we're working on that. You know, that, was, that was huge. And um, that's one big thing that can be done, right? Uh, the second one would be a federal 36% interest rate cap bill. So we have the Military Lending Act uh, that passed uh, during the Bush administration, actually, and then and, improve, and then some tweaks and improvements made during the Obama administration, and it protects military, active duty military, uh, where you're not allowed to issue them loans of 36% or, or higher, because um, those um, military bases were also being targeted where there was a concentration of stores right around there, around their bases. So what we're asking for with, um, there's a new bill called the uh, Veterans and Consumer Fair Credit Act. So VCFCA, the Senate has introduced it um, back in July and we're waiting for the House introduction any moment now. It could be right now, I'm not on my phone, so I, <laughs> but any moment now uh, for that to be introduced on the House side. And so, that is just taking what has already been done for our military and, and passing along that protection to veterans and consumers as well. So those are, um, those are two big pieces that we're working on. And then there's just, uh, there's just a ton of other like loopholes that predatory lenders are, are jumping through, right? So it's, it's, it, there's a lot more as far as like FinTech and online lending and, um, rent to bank schemes, we're able to address some of that, uh, but there's still FDIC banks that are supervised by FDIC that could be using rent to bank. So, um, so there's, there's a lot in the FinTech space that we want to um, make sure, again, there's this balance, right? If there's online lending, then make, there's less money that you're spending on storefronts. So is that savings being passed along to consumers, right? Um, you know, a lot of loans that are, you know, we're not alone. We are early wage access, right? But, you know, there's, there are laws that we want to make sure if this is a loan, this is credit, that you are following the, the laws that we have in place. Um, so those are three big areas that we're looking at. And I think um, part of your question was just like, how, how are we going to get there? Something like that was the question. Yeah. I don't know yet. Uh, we're working on it. <laughs> we are we are being persistent. We are trying to make sure that um, a lot of the folks that have these strong protections in states like uh, you know, it's not just Maryland. It's New York. It's New Jersey. It's a, it's 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 uh, a lot of you know these eighteen states across the country to let them know like um, what rent a bank means. And I, I see something popped up in the in the in the comment as well. I'll, I'll explain that, but it's a threat to the states that have a cap. So, for example, I predatory lender, you know, in this state can partner with a bank that does not have an interest rate cap, and then I can lend in Maryland or I can lend in New York, where these states have strong interest rate caps. So that's your rent a rent a bank. So this isn't just about the states that have not had a chance to do a ballot initiative or a law or anything. This is about this is a threat to all of our states. Um, so I think that those are, you know, some of the things we're working on is just making sure that like a lot of folks here, I, I didn't know what a payday loan was. <laughs> so how are we here in these states going to fight to protect something that we didn't know uh, we, we, you know, could be targeted with. Um, so, so that's, that's one piece, just getting kind of the groundwork done. And it's a, it's quite an uphill battle. There's a huge lobby against us. They make a lot of money. So that's always quite difficult. 
And um, we're just going to be persistent and do the best we can. <laughs> but those are sort of the, the three areas that I think will help us when it comes to, you know, you, if you eliminate the predatory or you curb the predatory lending, you allow the other access to, you know, there's credit unions, there's community banks, there's churches, there's, you know, we, we saw so much during the COVID assistance, all the, all the assistance that families got, they didn't need to, to access loans, right? So increasing wages, like that's huge. Like there are, are so many other pieces that we need to work on so that we're not a country that's relying on just giving out credit and keeping people in debt and then worse, giving out predatory lending that's like, it's just not debt, it's, it's devastating to people's lives, so. Thank you, Graciela. And I'm really glad that you brought up the point that it's not just gaining consumer protections, but it's maintaining them and keeping them from being rolled back uh, or uh, uh, from being gotten around. That's yeah. such a challenge for consumer advocates. Well, before we turn to our other panelists, uh, we're going to hear from uh, one more, a longtime consumer champion, Congresswoman Maxine Waters. Happy 50th anniversary, Consumer Action. I'm so delighted to take part in this momentous occasion with each and every one of you. We have come a long way in protecting consumers over the past 50 years. It was a decade ago when in the wake of the subprime mortgage meltdown, we realized consumers needed a watchdog to protect them from unfair, deceptive, and abusive acts and practices in the financial marketplace. The Consumer Financial Protection Bureau was created in the Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform and Consumer Protection Act, and it was a crowning achievement that eliminates fraud, deception, and ripoffs. As chairwoman of the House Financial Services Committee, I'm so thankful to have partners like Senate Banking, Chairman Sherrod Brown, and everyone at Consumer Action who are essential in this ongoing fight to protect consumers and the CFPB, a constant target for obstruction. So I thank you for your work and I look forward to celebrating even more victories we will win together on behalf of consumers in the months and years to come. Thank you all. Thank you, Congresswoman Waters. It's great to have you in our corner. And now let's turn to Frederick. What healthcare issues are you going to be working on in the future and what needs to happen to achieve your goals? Thank you so much, Susan. Um, terrific question. And I do want to say again, it's so great to hear. I mean, I hope everybody on the who's participating today can hear the amount of opportunity that is resting in Build Back Better across so many important issues. I mean, this really is historic legislation. From a healthcare perspective, it's one of the most important bills we could, we could pass in history of the nation. Um, it's really important. So I hope folks out there are engaged and involved. Now, um, turning to, let's say, the near term, not the next month or two months, but then, you know, let's say the next year to a few years, at Families USA, we're very clear about where the healthcare movement needs to go, how we can really ensure that our health doesn't depend on our wealth, that every living soul in our nation can live their healthiest life possible. It's so important. It's foundational. Uh, without health, we can't achieve everything that we want for ourselves and our families. And so the first thing I would say is we have to make sure that coverage really is uh, affordable and meaningful, and it provides real financial security. So once an individual has secured coverage, they know I can avail myself of the healthcare system and I will not lose my house, not lose everything I've saved to, to stay healthy. That's a foundational principle. Um, and there are incredibly important provisions in the Build Back Better that will solve that. So I think that's our best chance right now to really make uh, incredible progress on that. Um, the second thing is that we have to make sure that our nation is much more thoughtful about the way in which our healthcare resources are utilized. We spend more than any other nation in the country, two or three times more in many instances, per person on healthcare, trillions upon trillions of dollars. Our prices are much, much higher than the rest of the world. Our outcomes are much lower. Our moms and babies die at faster rates. Um, there's so much progress we need to make on the value 
of the healthcare that we receive and the way we're spending the dollars. And so a very big focus at families is on that. It's really focused on the idea that we have to reorient our US healthcare resources to actually deliver health. We don't need the world's most expensive MRI. We don't need the world's most expensive drug that does almost nothing. What we need is health. What the American people want from their policymakers and from the healthcare sector is to live their healthiest life. There's a lot of work to do there. We are in a situation as a country where the tail is wagging the dog. The healthcare sector is responding to very distorted economic incentives uh, to do more and more, more the traditional fee-for-service model, which is just do as much as you can for those high margin procedures that often have very little real value and, um, and uh, turn away at that and make money, not anchor themselves in what's best for their patients and the families that are using their services. Uh, and that honestly is on us and on policymakers. We haven't created the right financial incentives. So we really need to change them. Um, and that really falls into two buckets. The first is addressing the underlying distortion. So things like drug companies, we give them a government grant of monopoly they abuse it like crazy, raise prices like crazy, play games. And right now what we're really doing is incentivizing smart lawyers to play tricks and not the great biomedical researchers that we want to be actually rewarded for, for creating life-saving cures. And so um, that's an example of the kind of distortions. Why in the world should a specialist get paid five times more than the primary care doctor, which all the research shows is gonna be much more likely to impact your health. That's another example of a distortion. But then also we're, look, we're working really hard on completely reorienting the, the, the resources in the healthcare sector. And that is around changing the model so that a provider, a health system, a group of, of primary care doctors, uh, a group of healthcare providers can come together and they can actually get paid to uh, maintain and preserve our health and not just simply do stuff. And that's this, risk, this, this sort of movement towards what are called risk-based models. We're very engaged and trying to reorient the incentives that way. And the last, uh, and probably the most important area of work for us is really on this idea that um, we do have this history in our nation of uh, hundreds and hundreds of years of systemic racism and disadvantages for people because of their culture, because of the color of their skin, because of where they live in the, in the country. That is a major impediment to ensuring every single person in our country has access to the best health possible. And so a lot of our work is also focused on how do we drive equity into our healthcare sector? How do we ensure that your zip code doesn't define your health, the, the color of your skin doesn't define your health, that every single person gets a fair chance to live their healthiest life? And we're doing a lot of work on that as well. Thank you so much, Frederick. I love the phrase, your health shouldn't depend on your wealth. <laughs> Okay, so uh, next I'm going to turn to Katrina. I know there are lots of things you'd like to accomplish in the future in the in the realm of privacy. What are some of them and um, how do you think that it might be possible to actually get there? Yeah, I, mean, I think the most important thing we need to do is just put an end to this era of self-regulation for technology, right? There's almost no rules right now in the US. So uh, it's pretty clear to everyone that the current system isn't working. Uh, we obviously need a new approach because, you know, like I said, there's, despite technology's prevalence in our lives and our economy, it's just, it's just a huge sector of our economy and there are no rules around it. I like, someone said to me, a Hill staffer said to me once, no one questions that we have an FAA because we have these giant planes that fly in the sky and you know, there are obviously safety issues with that. It's the same thing with data collection. We need, you know, we need some rules of the road. Um, you know, what we're left with right now is the fact that digital platforms are commodifying every tiny bit of our data, and that has real harms, especially for marginalized communities. You know, uh, we've all had the experience of being creeped out by an ad targeted at us. Many people assume that companies like Facebook must be using the microphones on our phones to listen to us because the ads are so creepy. They're not listening or using our microphones to listen to us, but the reality is even creepier. Uh, they don't need to hear us to know what we're saying or thinking because that's how much data they're collecting about us. You know, the websites we visit, where we're going, who our friends are, what those friends are reading or doing. They are tracking so many data points about us that it, it truly seems like they're listening to us. Uh, and for many people, that means being creeped out by an ad. 
But for marginalized communities, it can often mean not being shown an ad for housing or for job openings. And that deprives individuals of life opportunities. So allowing tech companies self-regulate, clearly not working, causing very real harms to individuals in our society. Uh, so what you know, advocates, we as advocates have to push Congress to do and what the public should be pushing Congress to do is to enact a strong comprehensive privacy law and create a dedicated agency to deal with these issues, a data protection agency. Um, so when we think about what needs to be in a privacy law, right, privacy laws need to limit the amount of data companies can collect about us. It's not enough to say uh, a company has to tell me what they're collecting about me. That doesn't, that doesn't help. That just still lets them do everything and just, and just tell me which, you know, if I, you know, asked Google what they had about me, I can't imagine what I'd get back. Uh, so it, it's, it's time to limit what companies can collect about us. Privacy legislation also has to protect against discriminatory uses of data. It has to extend civil rights protections online. Uh, it has to require algorithmic fairness and accountability. You know, the use of, a lot of us heard this during the whistleblower, the Facebook whistleblower here, right? The use of algorithms and artificial intelligence is really the next wave of technology that advocates have to worry about. Um, you know, we, we just shouldn't let it grow unregulated the way we have with data collection. Let's get ahead of it now before it's, you know, so big it's, it gets harder to regulate. Um, you need to think about dark patterns, right? If dark patterns are, are these processes, you know, that are designed to manipulate individuals into making choices that are in the business interest rather than your own. I'm sure you've all encountered them if you tried to cancel a subscription. You know, you have to hit seven buttons in order to cancel, but if you want to stay on, there's a really convenient big button to do that. Um, we we can't have uh, take it or leave it terms, you know, or, or pay for privacy uh, provisions which discriminate against those with less means. Privacy shouldn't be something just for you know, those that could afford to buy it, that, you know, it needs to be something that's available to everyone. Uh, a federal privacy law also has to allow states to pass stronger laws. This is a big issue in Congress. Um, you know, the, the industry wants Congress to pass one weak law in their, their preference uh, and not allow states to pass stronger laws. But technology just changes too fast. That's not possible. I mean, if, you know, it's 2021 and Congress hasn't passed a law, we don't want to be stuck with whatever law they pass for, for very long, uh, you know, we, we need states to be able to act. And privacy laws just have to have strong enforcement. You know, if a law doesn't have teeth, we end up with situations like the WhatsApp issue I spoke about earlier. Um, so we need to allow individuals to have a private right of action so they can, you know, bring a lawsuit to protect their rights. And we also need, like I said, an independent data protection agency dedicated to privacy, data protection, you know, oversight, enforcement, just deal with all these emerging privacy challenges. You know, they'd be an agency would be able to look under the hood at big tech companies, uh, regulate and oversee these, you know, high risk data practices like consumer scoring or, you know, the use of AI and biometric data and would have experts, in the, you know, in this complicated field. Um, right now, the FTC's authority is really kind of backward looking. It's, they're stuck with what's called unfair and deceptive acts and practices. So something has to happen before they can act, you know, say, you know, the, the Cambridge Analytica situation with Facebook, um, they went back and issued a fine based on what happened. But if we had a data protection agency, we could give that agency the ability to, you know, regulate high risk data practices and stop those privacy harms before they happen and allow technologies to innovate around privacy, you know, encourage innovation around privacy. So, you know, I think just given the enormity of the challenge, we really need that data protection agency to complement a strong federal privacy law. And, and we'll, we'll keep pushing Congress to do both. And I'm just so thankful to have consumer action beside me in this fight. And I hope that the next time they have a change makers convening, we can cite the creation of a DPA as one of our successes. <laughs> I hope so. Thank you, Katrina. Uh, really, um, all of you have described things that need to be done that, uh, uh, should be nonpartisan. Um, everybody should want their constituents to live in safe, affordable housing, um, not to be ripped off by payday lenders, um, to have good health, um, and to be free of uh, the kind of surveillance that uh, Katrina described. Uh, and uh, working together, I'm sure that we can achieve these goals. So uh, now is the time for audience questions and don't put them in the chat, please. 
but put them in the Q&A box, which you'll see on the bottom bar of the screen. And we'll try to get to as many of those as possible. And I should get there to see uh, what questions there are. There's no questions yet, um, but please um, uh, provide some. And in the meantime, um, I'm going to see if there are questions from elsewhere that uh, we can pull up that would be useful to ask. Okay, here's one. Oh, hold on. Technical difficulties. The Biden administration, and this is for Nikitra, has allotted tens of billions of dollars to help prevent a tidal wave of evictions and foreclosures. What concrete steps should be taken at this point to ensure that these emergency funds and housing protections get to the people who need it the most? We really need states to do everything in their power to get the funding out. Um, the funds that have been provided in the American Rescue Plan Act were provided so that we could keep people housed. We are still in an ongoing health pandemic. We cannot forget that. Um, we've not passed that benchmark. So we need states to do everything in their power to make sure these dollars get in the hands of, of renters all over the nation. So that's critical. We also need to make sure those dollars are distributed in an equitable manner. We see families of color, according to reports from the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, you know, struggling to make their monthly housing payments, whether they're a renter or homeowner. So there is also targeted um, assistance for homeowners who are struggling during this time in the American Rescue Plan's Homeowner Assistance Fund. There's been $10 billion placed there. So we need for the Treasury Department to really make sure states have equitable distribution plans to make sure these funds reach socially disadvantaged individuals, which which is a huge feat um, in that legislation because that's a concept that we borrow from the small business section. And it just means that the funds are going to families that have a history of struggling with accessing a mortgage credit. So we have to do everything that we can to keep people housed. And we particularly with homeowners this time have to make sure we don't lose homes. The difference with this crisis in the great recession is people are counting on, you know, these increase in housing um, appreciation to be a safety net. Um, there is power in maintaining that home. There is power in being a homeowner over the long haul. We don't want to see families of color all sell their homes and end up in the rental market. That's going to push and drive up um, the cost of rents, which is a real outcome from, from the Great Recession already. Thank you. And um, here's a question that could actually go to Graciela or you, Nikitra, um, and maybe both of you want to weigh in. Any ideas on improving the ability of those folks with no credit reports, but who pay their household bills on time to be qualified for a mortgage with a credit score? So we're talking about people who have thin or non-existent credit files. Um, what can be done to help them uh, qualify for credit? And, whether it's mortgages or other kinds of credit. Sure, I can I can start. Um, so you know, I, I was previously a housing counselor, and so dealt with many families who were in that situation. And there's forms of um, what's called non-traditional credit, where you can put together a package for a lender to show that right. Like I have got daycare costs, and here's twelve here's twelve months of payments, on time payments. Um, you know, here is my uh, my utility bills and things like that. And so that there there is a form to do. There is a way to do that. It does become you know time consuming, and lenders don't often like to do it. But I, I would be a little hesitant to to say let's include that in a credit report because there's so many uh, assistance programs when people fall behind on utility bills. And so you know I, I don't know I don't have a magic answer to that, except to say, to my knowledge, you can, you know, advocate for the acceptance of non-traditional credit and, um, and, and working with a housing counselor. Thank you. And Nikitra, did you have anything to add? 
Yeah, I would I would ditto Graciela's point. Um, I think we definitely need to think about alternative forms of, of credit. And I just want to lift up that just, um, I guess, late summer, Fannie Mae announced that it was actually going to start allowing um, the use of rental payment history um, for the mortgages um, that you know, that they buy and guarantee. So there are innovative things happening in the marketplace um, so that we can make sure um, people have an opportunity to have a fair evaluation. We wanna make sure though, that as they're doing that, people aren't being penalized and that they're not paying a premium because they're using that rental payment history. Um, we, we know that so many people have, you know, quality um, credit profiles and in the current systems that we use to, to really monitor credit, we have to be careful that they're not baking in discrimination and holding out um, families who have a history of underservice. Thank you. Um, Frederick, I'm gonna give you the first bite of this, but really this is a question for everybody. So others, please feel free to jump in. How can public interest leaders like those on today's panel help get more young people, especially those from diverse backgrounds, interested in working on the kinds of issues that you all work on and that consumer action has championed for 50 years. In other words, what steps can organizations like yours take to create the next generation of change makers? Susan, what a great question. And to be honest, I don't know if my other panels feel this way, but boy, I'm ready for them to take over. <laughs> it's, been long, it's been a long fight. Um, you know, it's a, it's a really deep question. And one that I think a lot of folks in our space are really thinking about how do we make sure that uh, we're bringing the next generation in and that we have really diverse sets of uh, points of view and experiences in helping to inform the movement. At families, we take this super seriously. I think first and foremost, you know, we, uh, one of the things we really take a lot of pride in and, and really uh, see as one of our primary missions is to serve in a translational role. Uh, health you know, policy, legislation, regulations, administrative action, it can be incredibly dry and boring um, when you're in the middle of it, when you're reading through the regulations, when you're fighting through the specific details, but the impact, the ways in which those actions can change lives is so deep and so profound. So I think our first and most important role is to tr is serve as translators, to explain to folks that there is, we have the power, for example, to ensure, I, I mean, the most popular thing in Affordable Care Act, you can't be discriminated by an insurance company if you've been sick before for a pre-existing condition, right? That's an incredibly powerful concept that the entire country rallied around, right? But it was also an incredibly boring piece of legislative text, right? So we have to serve that translational. Second, I, it's really important to understand that people's frustration with our uh, policymaking system is a frustration with our constitution and with the way the framers of our country set up the system. We have a system that is built on the concept of consensus. That can be incredibly frustrating to young people in particular who are watching the unfair world, don't, are not particularly interested in being patient and want to see change now. And I think that's another really important translational piece. We spend a lot of time thinking about how do we nurture, encourage, foster that energy, but then help them understand the way to channel that into real change. And I think that one of the things that concerns me a lot right now is um, we're living in an environment where there's so much um, of our society that's being pitted one against the other. Um, and you know, we know there's a lot of, of, of research and reports coming out that part of this is, is you know, the politicalization of everything and how hyper um, tribal our politics have become, but also part of it is that we have, for the first time ever in our society, uh, algorithms that are using machine learning to activate our deepest, most tribal elements of our brain, our reptilian brains, to see each other as other, right? And what worries me a lot with some of the young folks that are in the movement right now is that that tribalism permeates in. And the, 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 one of the deepest powers of our consumer movement is that we are not talking about just the needs of uh, a person living in Mississippi or a person living in New York or a person living in California. Each and every issue that's been addressed today is an issue that we all hold and have. And when we see these issues as issues that relate to all of us, we win. 
When we get divided, when it becomes an issue for Republicans or for Democrats or for people of color or for gay people or for straight people, what you end up in is a place where the division stops us from succeeding. And status quo is very good for a lot of people. A lot of businesses out there really want status quo. So we have to be careful to make sure that as the movement evolves, as we hand these reins off to other people, we don't let the interests that want status quo to keep us divided, that we unify and we make sure everyone understands every family in this country wants to know that their children can be healthy. Every family in this country should be able to get a house and, and afford, uh, go through the, the process of financing a house when they need to, right? Every person should, uh, should have protections from a bank being able to just charge them an outrageous interest rate. And every person's data should be protected. These are core principles that every family, and so we have to make sure we stay in that unified place because that's where the power is. You know, it was a really deep question and you gave a really deep answer, Frederick. I really appreciate it. And I'm gonna move on because we have a privacy question for Katrina. Regarding privacy, how do we avoid the twin killers of multiple exemptions slash vague definitions that allow companies to barely change what they do right now? Parentheses, the service provider carve outs, for example, which undermine the newest California initiative. And two, what about preemption? How can we avoid that? Wow, that one's really getting into the weeds there on privacy. Um, <laughs> but I'll try to keep it fairly high level because you, you know, Susan, we could go on and on about these exemptions. Um, you know, where we're seeing action on privacy right now is in the states, it's in state legislatures. So what we as advocates need to do is educate state legislators and their staff about what these exemptions really mean, um, you know, what, what the results will be because they're hearing from industry lobbyists and they're, you know, their voices are strong and they are very well funded. So, you know, it just, we need to, we need to make sure our, you know, education, our public education mission and our, you know, our, our discussions with legislators are clear on the impacts of these definitions. You know, it seems it's wonky, but this is, this is what legislation is, right? This is what policy is. It all comes down to the definition. So, that's what Epic keeps doing, what Consumer Action keeps doing, what CFA keeps doing. We're talking to state legislators about um, about these, you know, these definitions and uh, how to make sure that they're, you know, clear and um, not leaving these gaping holes that technology companies could drive a truck through. Um, and then on preemption, it's the same thing. We're actually working with, you know, if we get strong state laws, it will be harder for Congress to preempt those state laws because then the you know members of Congress from those delegations will push back. They're not going to want their state laws preempted. So you know obviously California was a different process because they have ballot, you know, crazy ballot question rules, but you know, we're working with legislators in Massachusetts, in Connecticut, in Maine, in you know, Minnesota, all over the country, uh, to try to pass strong privacy laws that that'll just make it even harder for for Congress to preempt. And then there's also the issue of like it's and we're working on a paper on this, it's actually crazy for Congress to think that they can preempt all state privacy laws because there's, you know, a long, long history of, um, you know, common law in terms of, you know, as simple as like peeping Tom laws, you know, you, you just can't. There's just so many privacy laws in the books. There's no way that Congress could preempt them all. Well, on that optimistic note, <laughs> thank you for joining us today for this Change Makers convening. We hope you enjoyed it. And special thanks to Nikita Bailey, Graciela Aponte Diaz, and Frederick Isasi, and K Katrina uh, Fitzgerald for their hard work and commitment to improving consumers' lives. And happy 50th birthday, Consumer Action. And with that, this convening is closed. <laughs>